Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Jess Larry, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. We have Monica McNutt. Welcome. Hi, guys. Monica is a what are you a sports reporter? Oh, gosh. Analyst. Basketball host, host, analyst. Host. Host. Like what, all of the else? above. What else? We're we missing. We working. Um, cycle instructor <laughs> on the side. Okay. And you know, just trying to take care of my mentals, my chicken. Shout yeah. out to Marshawn. Now I saw you the other uh, you tweet the other day that you misplaced your Beats by Dre headphones on the plane, oh. and you said that it messed up your movie watching experience. Very much. Did so. Did you have to use the airplane headphones? So I was the worse. Listen, not airplane headphones. So full full context. Okay. It was before the Knicks lost to the Pacers. So it was team travel, charter life, smooth. We love it. Um, I used my AirPods, mm-hmm. but the plane's still loud. Oh. So it was very much like I could kind of hear. I want to watch this versus you know the surround experience. Who were you the watching? Beats. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith on Amazon Prime. Is it good? I uh, I'm getting into it. It took me about three episodes. Okay, so it was trash. a little predictable. Okay, yeah, but I want to support. I think so. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna hang on. Did you ever find your headphones? Um, I did not. I, I the locators lost. I'm pretty sure I lost them on the trip to Chicago. I'm one of them people that I don't lose a lot, but when yeah. I can't find something, I, I lost it. So you just left it somewhere. Yeah, and somebody got them. I hope they're blessed. Okay. <laughs> well, well, when you walked in, you and Charlemagne were having a, a conversation about uh, makeup. Yes. <laughs> like discuss because he, he, he was he was like I don't understand why you bought this because he was like did you get I'm this treatment and he was like I haven't got that treatment no. he's like oh my god that treatment Shout is so out well to Brenda, Brenda Cologne, yes. our amazing makeup what artist. treatment are you talking about sir because I was she, amazed she, when she removes the makeup the the removal is incredible I'm gonna have to tap in now yes. the problem though is I be trying to savor the face by Brenda. Mm-hmm. And then she's not in my house at night. I knew so. those were in your eyebrows, Charlamagne. I knew that. <laughs> what do you mean? He's absolutely my bro. Now let's talk. Can we talk some sports for a little bit? Let's do some sports. Let's let's talk WNBA. Well, let's talk about Monica first. Can we get to know Monica before we get into the sports? Okay. You know she played they basketball in college yes. for the Georgetown Hoyas. I did. I did. Why did you stop playing? You know what? Okay. So I was very realistic, right? And I remember saying to my dad, like, I don't want to be 28 coming back from overseas and being at entry level positions. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't, this is the, I don't live with a bunch of regrets, y'all, but it is the one thing that I do regret not even trying to Mm. see if I could stick on a roster in a W. I had so much respect for the craft. I didn't think I was good enough. And frankly, I was ready to put my energy elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Basketball was like third grade every Saturday, every summer, you know what I'm saying? That commitment. And so it was kind of like, all right, I'm ready to do something else. So I did not attempt to go pro. I immediately began my foray into media. Do you Why think do you, you could have went pro? You think you could have went pro seeing everybody that the way they played and knowing the way that you play? I graduated 2011. I think I could have made a roster. I don't know if I would have stuck for the entire season, if I'm honest. Mm. The W is just that tough. Mm-hmm. It's just that tough. Why do you feel like, you know, um, like like you said you have regrets, but it's like you, you, you physically know or spiritually know when it's time to move on to the next thing. Correct. So if you knew that, like, why do you still have regret? I think I, trying would have honestly given me some intel in terms of the process, for mm-hmm. one, which would have benefited me now. And then I think it would have been like, well, you tried it, now let's move on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Even if the result was still, you're going to move on. Because if the plan was this time to move on, it was going to be revealed one way or another. Gotcha. So that's the only... And I, I use regret lightly. There mm-hmm. are a few things that I look back and I'm like, I should have done that. Mm-hmm. Um, thankfully, I don't live with a ton of those, so... So do you feel tall for no reason? Uh, no, I love being tall. Okay. I feel tall on purpose, okay, baby? Like, yeah. it took me a long time to get comfortable in these size 11, size 12 feet, okay? Mm-hmm. Come here. Because you oh walked in when, when we hug, but you, like, <laughs> lean down. That's disrespectful to short men. I don't know if you know that, but to short king, I that's, feel like that's disrespectful. When it's it's, it's me. not. Yes, it is. What am I supposed to do? Like, when tall women kneel down in the picture, like, they, like why are you doing that? Like, I'm not okay. a goo-goo, good, good. Like, just... I wouldn't be tall if you weren't short, though, so we work together. <laughs> like, it, we work together. I'm surprised he didn't try to post you up. Usually, any any woman here that's tall, he tries to post you up like he plays Charles, basketball. Don't do that. Don't do that. We passed that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. He does, it all, he does that all the time. I do the women I know. I'm not going to do that. I don't know my girl like that. He's in the street, right? And he told me, he's going to try to bat him out. We, we're all accustomed to it. Move. No, get out of Move, here. Move, man. Get out of my way. Now, how did you get to being an analyst and reporter? Um, So, when I graduated in 2011, we lost to UConn, ironically, in Philly. And at the press conference, final press conference, I'm like, yo, like, my career's over. I'm trying to get into media. What's up? Um, and a couple of folks in the audience actually gave me cards and connected. And I think I'm very thankful to my parents. Advocating for myself has been something that I have never struggled with, mm-hmm. courtesy of my parents. And so all along the way, I'm meeting these people and letting them know what I wanted to do. I actually ended up being at a Washington Post event um, and sitting in front of the director of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism or sports um, program for sports journalism at University of Maryland. Mm-hmm. Again, advocating for myself. He's like, come check out our journalism program. At the time, I didn't know who he was. Turned mm-hmm. out to be George Solomon. 
that gets the wheel rolling in me in terms of opportunities to mm -hmm. learn the craft of journalism, study it, be able to go and perform in various mediums, and then take my basketball passion and basketball knowledge and merge the two. So um, 2012, 2013, I graduated from grad school and then just, just kind of been pushing ever since. Mm -hmm. Was there anybody uh, that inspired you to want to get into broadcast journalism? Uh, Robin Roberts. Like, I was okay. a 90, 1996, 97 WNBA foundational years. Um, Robin Roberts was still uh, working on the call at that point. Um, and I just remember seeing her and then following her to ESPN and Sports Center, and obviously mm -hmm. on the GMA. Like, it was like, yo, like, that's me. Like, I could do that. And so I think Robin Roberts is probably my first muse in the space. And then I would oh, say wow. somebody like Doris Burke, probably. Mm -hmm. Does the stigma still exist that women don't know sports? 100%. Okay. Uh, it's it's changing, um, but it's definitely still out there. And I'll be honest, y'all, for me, uh, it was so funny. This week, Monday, first take, Stephen A., Shannon, all those guys. And Stephen A. has to take this moment to address this whole thing with Jalen Brown, right? Mm -hmm. And I am listening, and I'm like, Dag, this man been in the industry 25-plus years, well-respected, and he's still having to clarify. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, less than 10 years in, at least in doing that show and on that platform, it was this – that's just the nature of the beast moment. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, I didn't say that when people are like tweeting stuff at me. Like, I didn't say that. Or that's completely out of context. Mm -hmm. And so I think you learn yep. and you build the scar tissue, the tough skin to deal with it because it's just the nature of the beast. I do understand differently. We forget fan is short for fanatic. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when I'm engaging, I'm like, all right, is this misogynistic BS or is this just a crazy fan, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to be able, I don't want to say hold space, but you got to be able to navigate both. Mm -hmm. because there is still a sentiment out there that women just don't know what they're talking about. And for me, I'm like, look, we don't have to agree. That's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of human experience. But don't be nasty for no reason. That's my only thing. Yeah, I think when it comes to like uh, sports pundits, you can immediately tell if you like somebody just by mm -hmm. listening to them because you, know you know they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember the first time I saw you was on, I think, the Yes Network with Kaz. After MSG, a, yep, it was after, MSG. Was it MSG? Uh -huh. It was MSG? Okay, my boys love Kaz. It was with Kaz after a Knicks game. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I remember hitting Kaz, like, who is that? Like, she, you know, she, that, she knows what she's talking about. Not she because she's a woman, just right. that person knows what they're right. talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. That that compliment and compliments from basketball people mm -hmm. mean the world to me. Mm -hmm. Like, if this assistant coach or this coach or this former athlete is like, yo, we like what you do, like, Thank you. And it and like what you do doesn't mean we always have to agree. I was in across from Diana Taurasi two years ago at the uh, Women's Final Four. And she's like, Ma, you look like you're having fun, though. She's like, I don't always agree, which is fine. But you look like you're having fun um, and you've done the work. And that's, that is the mm -hmm. bottom line. Now, I got to ask you, uh, WNBA. Let's do it. There's been a lot of conversation recently about the WM uh, WNBA. Things have changed in the last year. Uh, but I think people wanted more. And, and I see them starting to talk more and more and more and more trash, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Caitlin Clark, for for example, right? You know, she's doing well, scoring twenty two points. Mm -hmm. That's difficult, right? Mm -hmm. the, like this is top level basketball, mm -hmm. but people wanted more. They wanted her to, like what she did in college, and they're mm -hmm. saying that this could actually hurt the WNBA. What's your thoughts on it? So two things can be true, and this is why the run up to Caitlin getting drafted and becoming a pro was so fascinating to watch for those of us that have been in the space, right? She's dynamic. She has changed the game. She's worthy of all the contracts, the dollars, the rising tide raises all ships, whatever. Although there is trajectory of the WNBA in the last four years, some of these things were going to happen anyway. But the W is also tough. It's 144 of the best women in the world, period. Not in the United States, in the world. And so she is fine and talented and will be okay. And there's also going to be a curve. And I think that's what we're seeing in real time. You don't get drafted number one because the team just won a championship. Right the up. team is struggling, right? And right. the Fever have struggled since they won a championship with Tamika Catchings. I think that was 2016. So they're trying to get back to the promised land, so to speak. I think the hope is, okay, we're turning in to watch Caitlin. Oh, but let me, I'm I'm learning about the Connecticut Sun. I'm learning about the LA Sparks. I'm learning about the Las Vegas Aces. These other teams that I now want to follow. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality, I literally had this conversation a week ago with one of my bosses, is is that fan base for her going to hang on while the fever continue to struggle? Now, I can't answer that. Um, I can already see growth in her first, what, two weeks, a month of the, of the season. Um, but I hope that the eyeballs that she's bringing are about women's sports at large and not just her, and that encourages and boosts the WNBA at large. I've never rooted for a white woman so much in my life. Okay. Because she has to be successful. I feel like, you know, the more success she has, the more success women's basketball is going to have. Like, people should want her to succeed. Like, I don't, it's kind of weird to see people rooting against her. So right first now. of all, let's, let, let Charlamagne and be, let's unpack that. Who, who is, who was Chuck talking to the other day? 
Like, who is Chuck talking to? Stop hating. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the internet. Yeah, yeah, you're right. right. Now, if you talk to the internet, make that clear. Because I have talked to WNBA players. I've talked to her teammates in um, Indiana. Like, folks are excited and thrilled. Mm -hmm. But the idea that the WNBA has to play kumbaya and not compete. Like, whoever said, I'm blank. Mm -hmm. Was it Jeff T that said y'all shouldn't be competing because you want to make her look good? I, I don't know yeah, if I said one of the podcasts I said you, say that yeah, right yeah. this clip like cut it out mm -hmm. cut it out like at the base at the foundation of this it is competition and that is beautiful and worthy of celebration now, if you're listening you don't know what she's talking about uh, he, he was saying that the WNBA should fall back off of her let her score let her score 30 40 the first two years and get more people involved and then play hard on her but I'm, I'm like you it's competition no, like nah no. I, I want to show that I can defend her I want right. to show that when she comes into my city that she's scoring two points that's, also like that's, that's an insult to, to her mm -hmm. she's a competitor she gonna go get. She gonna go do what she gotta do. Charlamagne, do not give this any real rational space in your head. Don't <laughs> even like, do it. I'm like Jeff might not be a little all. He might not be wrong. Y'all, because he was saying let her go Come crazy on. for two years, <laughs> get more people involved. Come you know on, y'all. Especially little white girls want to go see her. It's not like she's not getting shots. Come she's on, y'all. She's, she's going, going shots to be fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's I, to me. If I'm her, that's an insult. That's yeah. an insult. And it's only been what five games. Uh, I got to double check or something like that. Yeah, yeah five, I mean, that's intense. Like, yeah, I've seen sure. her score 20 a few times, but I'm looking at everything else she's doing. She's getting she's assists, the ball. you know, she's getting she's rebounds. Pass, she needs yeah. to cut, out, cut down on the turnovers, but yeah. I, she looked like she's doing, she's going to be all right. She's doing the thing quite as is kept. I don't, I shouldn't say quite as is kept, but it just hasn't been as much of a national headline. But her comrade in that class, Angel Reese, has been off to a rocket ship start. Ass, right? right? Like, she, Angel ass, is yeah. hooping, and I, hooping, and I'll be the first to say that in college, I was like, ah, how's this going to translate in terms of position? But the work ethic, the energy, get into the glass, like the toughness, all of those things have translated. And I'm really excited for her. This rookie class is dope. And I think the timing of it um, is really unique in terms of the growth of women's sports at mm -hmm. large. And then you have these personalities that you can latch onto mm -hmm. and really root for. And they are cool sharing their lives, mm -hmm. which is super dope. So it's a beautiful combination. So right now your rookie of the year so far is injuries. Uh, in terms of product, I mean, both of those teams are struggling. I haven't even thought about rookie of the year, Charlamagne. It's, mm -hmm. so, it's so early. My big thing going into the conversation of Rookie of the Year, though, is whose numbers are going to impact their team's overall improvement. Mm -hmm. So right now, you would give a slight edge to Chicago. Both of those teams are, are struggling. Well, not, I shouldn't say struggling. They're still young. They're still building. But you would probably give a slight edge to Chicago right now. And Cardoso not even... Yeah, she had a shoulder yeah. thing. She's getting, she's getting back. Mm -hmm. How hard is it being a woman at ESPN? Uh, so I live in New York. I operate out of the Seaport studio. I have no issues. The times that I've been in Bristol, I've had no issues. It is, that's a, ESPN is a great place to work. Every, no place is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't find it to be hard. I think I'm probably hardest on myself. And that's just the background of an athlete, right? Like, y'all, yeah, it's crazy to me. The other day I had um, a conversation with my guys over at Nick's Film School. And they asked me about my most memorable moment from the season. And this wasn't an ESPN moment, but it was with Mike Green, right? We're doing a game in Golden State. Uh, second game, I had the opportunity to call for the Knicks. Might have been a third. And Mike Breen does his signature bang on the call. And it was, like, surreal for me because I'm like, whoa, like, whoa. And so there's this moment of I'm sitting next to this Hall of Famer that has done this for umpteen years. Or even the other day on, in the studio. Like, I'm sitting across from Udonis Haslam, a three-time champion, like, a dude that played 18-plus years in the NBA. Like, and here I am, someone who has loved the game of basketball, done my best to study and prepare and just bring in my perspective. So whether it's ESPN or MSG, there's an innate confidence that you have to have in terms of my voice and my perspective as to this conversation. Now, that does not mean I don't operate with a ton of deference and respect because mm -hmm. I mean, I'm riding off all these people that I have the privilege to work next to, and I have a ton of respect for your experience. However, this is also what I've observed. Can we have a conversation? And so that goes back to basketball people being like, yo, that was that was solid. Or on the occasion where it wasn't solid, you have the opportunity to receive constructive feedback, adjust, and grow. So I have not found it to be hard. I'm very thankful. I've had the opportunity to do a bunch of different things, and I think moving forward, for me, it's about finding the lane that best suits my skill set. And I got to ask, you said uh, you did a, a bunch of Knicks games, right? Mm-hmm. It feels like the NBA gets a lot better and, and more talked about when the Knicks are in the only, playoffs. Only New Yorkers feel like that. It feels like that. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, no, it, it, it does. Are you crazy? <laughs> Listen, I, I, I would. So this is my first year as a Knicks radio analyst. And we had a blast, right? This is, was also probably their best year in terms of, you think of January. They was on that hot streak. I have learned how national television works. Mm -hmm. There's a few, y'all know, it's a few markets that hit and we're going to keep recycling these topics. 
when the Knicks are playing well, there's definitely more energy. Like, mm-hmm. there's more energy about the teams that are coming into the Garden. How did the results end up going down at the Garden? Like, the whole bit. So, yes, I think that's a fact. Now, I also got to ask, you know, uh, people have been complaining about the refs in the NBA recently. <sighs> and they're saying they make bad calls and, and this, that, and the other. What, what are your thoughts on the refs in the NBA? I think refereeing is a thankless job. Your best case scenario is we say nothing about you, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, I, the one I, time the Pacers complained 78 times, it's like, that's on, crazy. MVP. Like In that one game? Th- yes. I think between game <laughs> two and three, they sent 78 <laughs> clips to the league office. Wow. Rick Carlisle popped a $35,000 flying for his post-game press conference after game two. And in game three in, in Indiana, the tenor of the game was a little different. So that, it was that was worth every coin. Yes, yes. That was during the Knicks series? Yes. That was during the Knicks series, right? That's why I think they won that, that game, but good. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're going we to keep moving. Uh, I, I think the officiating definitely has room to improve, and it's just a matter of consistency. Even last night, complete accident. Was it Jalen Brunson clock kicks T.J. McConnell in the head? Mm-hmm. Everybody listening, J.J. Reddick, uh, Mike Breen, George Burke, like, by rule, this is going to be a flagrant one. Unintentional, but you kicked the dude in the face. And the crew ruled that it was just a regular foul. Like, it was like, oh. And so I think there is consistency by the letter of the law that is missing, um, and that probably be my biggest gripe. And who's the face of the league right now? You look at some of the biggest stars in the league. They didn't make the playoffs. Well, uh, are out the playoffs, I should say. You, you, LeBron, you're talking Curry, you're talking Kevin Durant. These guys are out. So who is the face of the league? And we've only been debating this for like three weeks on television. Ha! Ah, I still think that those guys, when you think NBA, you think of the Giannis, KD, Steph, and LeBron still first in my mind. But I do think we are witnessing a changing of the guard. Minnesota might get swept, right? It looked like that's how it's going to happen. And so I think that probably puts a little bit of a pause on the Anthony Edwards talk. But then you got, like, Kyrie who's going off alongside Luka, right? They love Kyrie now. They totally listen, change. Totally listen. change. Michael Jordan is the face of the NBA. <laughs> okay. And you know how you know Michael Jordan Tell is me. the face of the NBA? Because even the greatest players that are still playing right now still get compared to Michael Jordan. Anthony Edwards is still getting compared you know, to, to to Michael Jordan right now. LeBron James, they still if he was in the playoff, they would say he's still chasing, chasing Michael, Jordan. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is the face of the NBA, guys and gals. Mm, okay. I don't know if I agree with that, but sure. I understand your logic. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think the face of the league is such a, it's a loaded question, right? Because so much of it is also like wanting to. And so in terms of the guy that's front-facing and vocal, it's definitely Steph. And LeBron, in terms of, like, they're going to cap- capture all of these deals regarding the league. They're going to mm-hmm. wear mics. They, you know what I'm saying? They're going to be strategic in everything that they're doing. Um, I don't know if there's anybody that seems to embrace it quite the way they do until you turn around and got Aunt Edwards. But I will say this. I like Aunt Edwards, though. I love Aunt. He talks I love shit, Aunt. though. He's, he's like. He's honest. He, he comes from a side of it, it, more, almost like a more like an Iverson approach. Like, mm-hmm. I don't give a fuck about none of y'all. I'm gonna say what I gotta say, and it is what it is. And then if you talk back to me, I'm gonna try to dunk on you. By the way, I, 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 <laughs> I like love Anthony. It. Shout out to A. I love it. I like Anthony Edwards too. But it feels like once those Jordan talks really started to heat up for that week, his performances didn't match. So this is year one, though. I feel yeah. you on that. Mm-hmm. But this is year one. This, this, mm-hmm. this, I'm gonna say this baby, this young man, this athlete, this, this baby. Star, you know right? you're a black woman. <laughs> this baby. This little. <laughs> I mean, he's never been this far, and to yeah. me, he looks absolutely cooked and fatigued in the yeah. series. So I think he has time. Like this is the question around him has been: Is he the new face of the league? I don't think he's there yet. Mm-hmm. But like you said, the MJ comps, the personality, mm-hmm. all of these things are reasons for folks to tune in. And so I think he's got he's 22, y'all. He's mm-hmm. got plenty of time and plenty of runway. But I think knocking out the defending champs in the way that they did that made that very exciting. And talking trash all along the way, please. I, I gotta ask about one more Nick question. What we got? What do, what do the shut up? What, <laughs> what do the Knicks need to do for next year? You know they've been talking about: Do they trade Randall? Do they keep Randall? Do they bring somebody else in? You know, what should we do? So hear me out. I'm listening. I think people forgot what this team could look like healthy. Yeah. Right. Mitchell Robinson goes down in October. Julius goes down at the end of January. OG misses a month ish down the stretch of the mm-hmm. regular season. Um, you get to the postseason. OG still dealing with the injury stuff, and then obviously it ends with the Jalen Hand thing, right? Mm -hmm. Julius was a 25-9 and guy. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. All-star, right? All-NBA. Mitchell Robinson was having the best season to date before going down with that foot injury, and then Mm -hmm. when he did get healthy, he was productive until he got hurt again in that Philly series. I actually would be okay if this team stood its ground Mm -hmm. and ran it back. Healthy. But to me... 
the culture has to be protected. Yeah, I know y'all heard all the conversation about Tibbs. I was, I like wanted to kick anybody in the face that wanted to talk to me about Tibbs and minutes. Like, stop it. Say Tibbs work. Pe- th- th- work Come on now. Like, we trying much. to win. Y'all want to count minutes? Y'all want Ws? Like, what are we doing? So, if they're going to add, I think that front office has earned tremendous respect with the trade that they made to get OG and Precious Detrua, and even the two guys out of um, Detroit were beneficial down the stretch. They deserve respect. To me, you got to get a guy that fits the Tibbs system. You got to be able to play. You want to play on both sides of the floor, and the ball can't really stick. I think the misconception is that the ball has to stick with Jalen. Jalen, to me, is an incredible high basketball IQ guy. Yes, he's going to get his buckets, but if you gave him somebody that also was drawing a double team, which is Tibbs' favorite thing to say, like, he's going to pass the rock. He's going to get off of it because he's a winner. Um, So I would actually be okay if they ran it back and they were healthy. But whoever it is, you got to be a real hooper and not in the NBA because of the lifestyle, and you just happen to be talented. Devin Booker, they've been saying. What's your thoughts? Don't love that. Why not? Two ball dominant. And what are we doing on the other side of the ball? Okay. Bron- I, I just, I don't, I just, I don't love that one. Bronny. Bronny? I mean, I see where you're going there, right? <laughs> Bronny. <laughs> <laughs> I do see where you're going. Look, I, that is the, literally Monday, should LeBron James test free agency, sincerely, right? It's two places in my mind. Philly has the money. They could actually do it. And everybody's like, he ain't going to Philly, ain't no chance. And then in terms of brand and star power, like it ain't no place like, like New York. Um, I don't think that's realistic, but that's a guy you don't question his work ethic. You don't question his availability. Like mm-hmm. he gonna hoop when he went as long as he's healthy. He gonna hoop. Is Bronny ready for the league? I have not watched Bronny enough, so I can't say. But I do appreciate that. I think my favorite thing in this process, as the highlights have come down from the combine, was his player comps. Like he was honest. Like he's like these are the kind of guys. They, mm-hmm. I love Davion Mitchell. Like they called him off night in college because when he guards, the other guys have off nights, and that comp was one of my favorites. Obviously, Derek White, I think, was the guy he mentioned as well who's had a tremendous path to get to where he is now with the Celtics as they head to the finals. Mm -hmm. Um, So I liked that he was in touch and he wasn't delusional in that Mm -hmm. way. I don't question that the the young man is willing to work. Um, This draft class might be the opportunity that makes most sense because you're not talking about a Victor Wimbayama, a Zion, or a Ja. Um, I think you can get ready. You know what I'm saying? Like, And if he has anybody, if he has the opportunity, his dad is LeBron. He going he going to tell you what you need to do in terms Correct. of the work, and not just from the nepotism side, but literally from the work, because that's one thing LeBron has never cheated. Caitlin Clark versus Bronny James one on one. You want to like? I'm gonna say Caitlin <laughs> off of like go women, but like also, what? what can they play horse? Horse, horse. I'm saying Caitlin. Okay. Yeah, because she she she's she gonna she's she gonna she do buckets. shots. She's gonna give you stuff, curry shots. I think one on one, Caitlin will take them. I, I have not watched Bronny close enough. I can't say. Okay, okay. But I'm just in my head. There's a little more athleticism there. That could be problematic. You said something earlier that was like you said the person has to want to play ball, not the lifestyle. What was yeah, it you, you gotta want to hoop. You gotta want to work and hoop. You can't just be an NBA player because of the lifestyle. I feel like you said that, and I never even thought about it, but I feel like that's majority of the league. It feels like a lot of these people are just into the lifestyle as opposed to. Wanting to go out there and really be the best. Not I mean, New York players. It's a hell of a lifestyle. I ain't mm-hmm. mad at them. If mm-hmm. you if you are talented enough that your talent keeps you afloat, then God bless you. Like I ain't mm-hmm. that talented. I gotta work hard. Like you know what I'm saying. And I I don't. That is a real like. Only you know. Mm-hmm. Only well I shouldn't say that. Only you and your teammates know mm-hmm. who those types of guys are. But to me, the culture that Tibbs has built, those guys. Off days, what are those? I mean, besides taking care of their bodies and medical, but, like, the opportunity to go improve your game. Like, a dude like Josh Hart can't survive playing three straight 48-minute contests because he just skates skating off talent. Like, even if the work is not necessarily on your feet, it's how you eat, it's taking care Mm -hmm. of your body. Like, you know what I mean? Um, And this current Knicks group is a really cool group of dudes that are willing to work. I think the Knicks team this year is going to change the league a little bit. The way that they work, the way that they hustle, the way that they want minutes, the way that they dive on the floor, they look like old NBA the way they play I like, think that's fair I think yeah. that's fair and I think I in the last couple of years y'all I'm like simple things should not be conflated with easy right it sounds simple to just play hard and work out mm-hmm. I work everybody but that's not necessarily easy yeah, you know what I'm saying yeah, when that's yeah. your identity um, and I think that is what has allowed them to be so successful but then you look at their leadership whether you argue about Tom Thibodeau in the minutes or not, you're mm-hmm. never going to question his preparation. Correct. Same thing with Jalen Brunson. Has one at every level. You're never going to question his preparation. He's not going to cheat the work. And so that sets the temperament of the entire team. Yeah, what you said, the, that line you said made me think of even college with the NIL, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm like, what do you tell these youngins that are in school who have the talent and they have the talent enough to make the millions of dollars that they're making? Like, what do you tell them to keep them motivated other than 
there's more money in the NBA. So it's so so it's like money is the motivation now. So, so I, it's still lifestyle. Right. It, well, I think we could throw in like true love of the game. Mm-hmm. Right? Like for whatever may come with it, there are dudes in the league that we know just love the game. Mm-hmm. Right? Like Kyrie's on this Renaissance tour, if you want to call it that, but like you never questioned whether he loved the game and his nice talent, stuff. right? It was it was some other stuff, right? Like you look at a guy to me. Um, like Drew Holiday, I don't question that he loves the game. Jalen Brown, mm-hmm. I don't question. Jason Tatum, all, like I don't question that those dudes love the game. Now they might not always come to the podium spitting fire, like mm-hmm. you know, being intense, but like I don't question that they love the game of mm-hmm. basketball. And I think when you truly are in it, not just for the love, but also to win at a high level. And I'm talking from my experience, and I finished playing ball in college. Like there is not a sacrifice that is too great when you're all in. What do you? What are your early thoughts? Uh, you look like we're about to get a Boston Dallas. Great cities. I'm happy about that. I mean, I'm sad for many. One of my homeboys is, in a, is part of the mini organization. But I, this is going to be a great series, y'all. Okay. Like, the security guard downstairs was like, who you got? And I was like, bro, I'm not ready to make picks yet. I can't, I'm not ready to make picks. I I really feel like this is Boston's year. Mm, Dallas and been playing, though. Dallas been balling. Dallas has been balling against a defense that can't deal. Boston has the pieces mm. to deal. That's right. Right? Like, Drew Holiday... I know defensive player of the year, Rudy Gobert, like, respect it. But in terms of most versatile defenders, like, if that was a separate award, Drew Holiday, OG Ananobi, like, those type of dudes that can guard one through five. Who stops Kyrie? The team. It's a collective. <laughs> but listen to me. If 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 they're running pick and roll, right, Drew got to switch with, I don't the first three, the other three guards, right? Tatum, Tatum Brown, Brown um, Drew, White. White, mm-hmm. White, yeah. That ain't easy. Now, I'm not saying Kyrie still might not finish with 30, and I'm not saying Luka not going to hit some crazy shots. But they also got to go down on the other end, and they're going to have to defend as a collective. Now, Dallas's defense has been a lot better than I think folks gave it credit for, particularly after those trades. And I love the hunger that P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford have brought to that team coming from organizations that wasn't doing nothing. Um, but at the same time, like, the chess match of this might very well come down to Missoula and Jason Kidd on the sideline. Mm. Right? Like, yeah. you got Drew Holiday, who has won. You got Kyrie, who has won. Both won alongside big-time faces of the okay. league type of guys, respectively. So there's an experience there. As a collective, Boston been to a few finals, at, well, a couple at this point, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, they get it. And as much as Kyrie exper- Kyrie's experience is powering the Mavs, like, what does the rest of that group look like on the biggest stage, assuming that they're going to get there? We're not, mm-hmm. We don't count Minnesota all the way out till they all the way out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm excited for this finals. I'm really excited for this finals. And this finals, if, these, if the conference oh, finals end finals, in yeah. five, like, this is going seven. This is going to be so much fun. Mm-hmm. Kyrie the villain. Back at the team that he was team once he was. a part of. Man, don't you remember he oh, yeah, walked on the, on the, um, the logo? Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, the logo. KP, yeah, hated him for that. Yeah. if Chris Dasperzingas gets healthy, he was in Dallas at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like this, That's I'm excited for this one. Question, what's what your thoughts on uh, the gambling of the NBA now? I hate it. Tell us why. Um, I just think it's dangerous. And even this year when um, the Porter Kid had his episode, I just was like, I understand making an example but literally, whether it's insert gambling property here, the tagline of the commercial is the side effects, and if you need help, call 1-800-GAMBLING. <laughs> so now we're going to act like we're not presenting something that comes with a cautionary tale, and now this dude gets no grace? I felt like that was incredibly unfair. I also think that besides, like... The he was the example, though. He was the example. He, he wasn't a big player where it would hurt. He was the example. I feel you, Envy, mm-hmm. but you really going to roll this out with the... Caution tape, and then I have no grace. Because they wouldn't do that to, to Envy's point. They wouldn't do that a, to a, a bigger star. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Then you have zero grace. Like if this is if this actually could turn into a problem, we we just gonna skip the part that you might have a problem, and you just got to be the example. Yeah, I thought that that was heavy handed and unfair. Um, I do get it though, but like I thought it was heavy handed and unfair. In general, it's also changing the dynamics between these players and the, and fans. In such a I crazy it. way. I hate it because now you got fans in there talking about one more pass. I need my on. One more pass. Come like, on. What? You know what I mean? One more rebound. I got to get my ball late. It's like, what? Come on. Like, my, I love my cousin. It's clueless about sports. Sending me parlays. Talking about something. Girl, I'm trying to win a little dollar. I'm like, get. I cannot. I cannot. Mm-hmm. Like, and I get it. Like, engaging. More money for the league. All that good stuff. But I really think we are entering very murky space. Particularly college space. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-mm, I'm not a fan. You, you don't trust the integrity of players? I trust the integrity of players, but I think it is only adding more pressure to what is already a pressure cooker. Got you, got you, got you. Right? Because now, if, first of all, anybody sitting on the court and I can hear you hollering about your parlay, you paid a grip for them tickets. Mm-hmm. I don't know what your relationship with gambling is. 
you hollering at players, we already got, you know, you saying X, Y, Z, the wrong thing. Like, a player can turn to a ref and be like, you know, they got to go. I, it just creates more tension in my mind that just doesn't need to be there. Sports are already emotional enough. Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about people's money? Oh, God. Or, oh, or God. a play that's not making a lot of money, like like what happened with Porter, and say, you know what? I'm a Paul ladies. <laughs> when I score 10 points, I'm sick. I need to come out the game. Which is why I understand why he had to be made an example, because there can be no room for that. But mm -hmm. even, we just started talking about officiating, right? Like, gambling is just putting so much more pressure on everything. That's right. Everything. Is, is it true that you got engaged and knocked your fiance's phone in the water? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Yes, that is true. When you was upset he was recording or something? No, no, no. We, I didn't knock it in the water. Okay. We were in Grenada. We, some of our best pictures have come on like self-timer. And he timed it and got on one knee on a self-timer. Then the wave came and knocked the phone over. So before I could say <laughs> yes, I was like, your phone. And he's like, is that yes? And I'm like, yeah, but your phone. Like, we need that. Um, it was a really fun, great moment, good story. Like You didn't good. look at that as a sign? Like, oh, my God. Um, was that God? I did not look at that as a sign. <laughs> I was, I was like very shocked in the moment. Um, no, no chance that that was a sign. If anything, mm -hmm. the phone was able to recover. Thus, the sign is that we will navigate adversity together. Ooh, Ooh. okay. I like <laughs> turn that. I like that. Is, is it tough balancing a career and a relationship? Because they like to tell women you can't have it all. <sighs> um, uh, my fiance is amazing, and we're both in sports, so he gets it. We get it. Is it tough? Yeah, anything worth having is tough. Mm -hmm. Is it tough maintaining your relationships and y'all? You know what I'm saying? In mm -hmm. your career, and so I think. The, it's funny, y'all. I hear my mom and my aunts and my grandmothers more in the last year than I think I ever have. Just that one line, keep on living, right? Keep I know y'all. You know what I'm saying? I know we all heard that, right? right? Keep on living. And I think the closer I get to both my dreams professionally and personally, I'm like, oh, this is what they're talking about. It's beautiful and I'm excited, but there is a level of energy and maintenance required so that these things are healthy mm -hmm. that you can't skirt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, um, yes, it's tough, but I'm absolutely enjoying it. And I'm so thankful to have a partner that gets it. Um, we, you know, really starting to have the conversations about family planning and what that looks like because we're all over the place with our jobs. And so those are not always comfortable conversations, but the beauty of it is, and one of the reasons that I felt for him was like, I realized very early, like, this is the type of teammate and partner that I want to do life with. It ain't always going to be easy, but I want to figure it out with you. We had Little Rel up here, and Little Rel said you should focus on the marriage, not the wedding. He said so many people focus on the wedding, but not what the actual marriage will entail, what the marriage mm -hmm. would look like. Amen, retweet. I, I agree. Now, mm -hmm. granted, my wedding, my wedding planner, Melissa Williams, is amazing. It's going to be beautiful, but we are also very intentional about working mm -hmm. on our foundation beyond that. Like, that's a day, I think the older you get, people, jobs all across the country, family members getting older, we really wanted a moment for everybody to celebrate. Mm -hmm. But we are not naive that that's just the day to celebrate, and there's a real substance and foundation that we're building. Now, I don't, I don't know how tall your fiance is. How tall is he? He's six foot. He's six foot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you ever? He's date in the NBA too. He's an NBA player. No, exactly. no, he got an NBA player name, but no, he's not an NBA player. <laughs> NBA I thought he was player part name. of the NBA players association. Players like association. He works okay, for players gotcha, association. Gotcha, he's gotcha. not an ex. No, um, he's not. Gotcha. He's not a player. He is my height. I know where you're going with this. No, but the reason I say that is Charlemagne always says that you know, women tall women should date short men, and I always say he's too short. He always feels away because he says short men. you making? He's just making this up. Not, okay, not, well get it straight. Made up a so, whole get it straight. Would you ever date a guy? What do you want to ask? Her that I'm, you're I'm afraid to ask her no, that not, you're making would this you up. Ever, would you ever date a guy as small as Charlemagne? Because a lot of times, tall women don't date that much shorter. So I, I think, Charlemagne, you're a little short for me, but I have opened my mind to too short. I'm, and my fiance knows this. Like, there was a time in my life, and I can remember me and my best friend, like, we was hoop girls. He's like, mm -hmm. girl, 6'3 is the minimum. Like, maybe 6'7 would be amazing. Like, whatever, whatever. My fiance is 6'. Like, and for me, I had to get to. You wouldn't do 5'2. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -mm. I had to get to a very real place where it was like, what matters? And my therapist, she gave me this project. She's like, your ABC list. I've applied this to relationships, work, friendships, the whole bit. Like, what what have you had in the past? What do you fall for? And what are the actual non-negotiables? And my fiance checked all the non-negotiables. And I was like, all right, bet. Like, height is not as big a deal as I thought it was. Yeah, and I'm not about to argue with you about missing your blessings because you haven't missed any. You got your, you got a great fiance. You got a great. I was like, wait, here. yes. You know okay, wait, I got it. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> great things come in small packages. I will give you that for sure. Yes, but I, I just think there is. That is a very personal decision. Like I have had friends that have like, girl, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. 
That's the truth. It's true. My assistant is it's six true. three, and I tell Bro, her all the time, "You might have blocked your blessing oh, because she hilarious. she was like, when I wear heels, uh, I tower over. It's and true. I, she didn't want to date anybody. You know, With Charlemagne's height. Dating a I short have, man is a very personal. Decision. It is a personal decision. <laughs> It is, bro. I I have heels that I'm taller than my fiance in, and he's fine with it. And I found that to be something that I loved as we continue to get to know one another and got deeper in our relationship. Because I I've dated taller dudes. I still wasn't as tall as you, but they didn't like how tall I was in heels, right? Mm-hmm. And so like, what what I'm supposed to do? I want to feel good too. And mm-hmm. so like, he's like, if you feel good, I'm good. Let's go. Like right. let's roll. And that's important. And so that matters. But I have heard women equate the height thing to feeling protected, which I get. <laughs> I get. <laughs> I do My height get it. don't fight. My okay. height don't fight. <laughs> what you mean? I get it. I do get it. But I'm also like, what society are we in where you gotta like drop your bags and fight in the middle of the street? Like, what's going on? That is hilarious. <laughs> man, man. Tell us about your nonprofit, Grow Our Game. Okay, so that's actually my homegirl, Chanae Joy Jones. Shout mm-hmm. out to her, a true New Yorker. Mm-hmm. She's a hooper, a referee. She runs the organization, Grow Our Game, which is basically keeping girls in sport. Um, from the age, I think her baby, her youngest babies are four, mm-hmm. um, all the way up to 13. Wow. And they have activations all through the city. They work out a lot in Harlem, but the parents are in. Shanae's energy is undeniable. She's effervescent, the kind of girl that got the zest for life and is just using sports as a vehicle to help these young women grow and develop in their confidence. At the end of every practice, they usually wrap it up with affirmations. You are kind, you are smart, um, you are beautiful, and you could do anything. And I think it's about using sport as a vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm a product of the power of sports for women. Uh, but at the same time, she has helped some young women go on to play D1 college ball. Mm-hmm. And I think that is beautiful. And so the things that sport gave me, y'all, in terms of confidence, friendship, the ability to communicate, all of those are foundational to life, whether you go on and play at a mm-hmm. high level or not. And so it's been such a blessing to be able to help put Grow Our Game on and be and partner with them in that work. The girls got a ton of energy, some hoopers in there, the parents are about it. And like like I say, my girl Chanae, she's whoo, she is always on energy bunny, like and I just love her passion for life. How do we support that? Um uh she's on uh, you can follow on Instagram, mm-hmm. Grow Our Game. The logo is G O G. Mm-hmm. It's a black and white logo. Make sure mm-hmm. you got the right one. Definitely tap in there. I'm sure there's links there to donate and get involved. Um and I'm always kinda of trying to shout them out. So it's, it's super dope. And uh, I want to ask one more question. What do you think about this new media world that we live in where you have, you know, the athletes hosting podcasts, uh, athletes hosting the YouTube shows? Like, what do you what do you think of that? And how is that impacting traditional outlets like the ESPN? I love hearing directly from athletes. Mm -hmm. Now, I will also say as someone in the media, I also shut it all down on purpose just because I need to recharge. Right. And I'm sure y'all can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are more players both men and women that are interested in doing it and giving a true behind the scenes lens than there are interested in maybe creating petty beefs and nonsense right but the idea of accountability i'm okay with that like mm-hmm. you cannot fire off at the hip and not expect anybody to say anything That's right right or not expect anybody to respond and so I know, because you know, I can remember in journalism school, like as this was starting to change and Twitter was really, or X was really starting to get popular, some of the OG writers were kind of like, I used to be a newsbreaker, now guys can break their own news. And I still think there's space for relationships and healthy relationships with trained journalists, but I also think it's okay to hear directly from players on their experience. I mean, whether you like or Draymond Green or not, like his podcast is captivating, particularly after something happened in the game and he got to address it. Like those are the pods that have the best numbers. I mean, you look at a guy like J.J. Reddick, right, who was an athlete, has really delved in and embraced the media thing. And who knows what his next chapter may be. Um, Lakers whether he, coach they whether he wants about? to go on to. Look, peak millennial. You can have as many careers as you want. Damn. <laughs> um, so I think it's cool. I think it's cool. I think it still needs to be done with respect. And if you really got an issue, people front facing are not hard to find. They got managers and teams. Like th- everything doesn't necessarily have to be addressed over right. the public medium. W- one last question. As a journalist, what is the number one mistake that people in new media are making? Because you're you're a journalist. Yeah. Right? So what do you think the number one mistake? And I'm not talking about just even with the sports, just in general, all of these people with podcasts, YouTube platforms, and everything. What do you think? So, and this is where you got to define yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Like, are you trying to fall into the journalism category or the discussion category? Mm-hmm. Because credibility is so e- fragile, right? It's easily mm-hmm. broken and it's hard to restore it. Mm-hmm. So I think whatever, wherever you are, be mindful of your credibility, right? Like if you want to talk about a, a hot button issue, do the appropriate research. 
or if you're just going to glaze over it, you need to be very clear. This is just high level. I'm not, I'm not the source on this. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just touching it because I think what you can do inadvertently, not just credibility with like your audience, but if you want to matriculate, say, say in sports, like, you got people that you have to work with that are looking at you like, what are your actual intentions here? Like, you trying to go viral or are you trying to respect the craft? Mm-hmm. And so I think credibility is something that you have to keep top of mind. All right. Well, Monica, we appreciate you joining us. That's right. Are you headed to ESPN now? Uh, no. Oh, okay. No, no, no. If if we get a game five, I will be out in Minnesota. If not, I'll probably be chilling until we get ready for finals and I'll be out there. Okay. okay. Well, it's Monica McNutt. How did they follow you? Um, Socials is McNutt Monica. Same on everything. All right. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Wake that ass up. Early in the morning. The Breakfast Club.